Everybody, welcome to Impact Theory. You are here, my friends, because you believe that human potential is nearly limitless, but you know that having potential is not the same as actually doing something with it. So our goal with this show and company is to introduce you to the people and ideas that will help you actually execute on your dreams. All right, today's guest clawed her way out of failure and poverty to become an award-winning rocket scientist who helped NASA launch 28 space missions by working her ass off despite a brutal childhood that saw her stabbed in the face by a young gang member, abused, and at times eating only ice because her family couldn't afford food, and failing at high school algebra, geometry, calculus, and chemistry, she was still able to transcend her circumstances and ultimately went on to graduate in the top five of her college class with a degree in mathematics. But her struggles didn't stop there. Hired by Boeing at 21, she found herself very out of place as a young woman of color in a male-dominated world, often the only woman in a room full of roughly 200 men. She had to endure hazing and discrimination on an almost daily basis. Despite that, however, leveraging her talent and drive, she managed to rise up the ranks and have an astonishingly successful career. She won the Modern Day Technology Leader Award, and in 2004, she was awarded Boeing's Company Professional Excellence Award. Her achievements have landed her on countless high-profile shows, including NBC and CBS News, Dr. Drew's Life Changers, Oprah.com, PBS, and her TED Talk on reprogramming the brain to overcome fear is incredibly popular. Since leaving the world of rocket science, she's applied her mathematical skills to banking and education alike, ultimately founding her own company, and she's now the CEO of OL Consulting Corporation and Publishing, where she is inspiring and educating the next generation as a popular speaker and creator of science-based entertainment and education. Please, help me in welcoming the woman People Magazine named the modern-day hidden figure, the author of Mathophobia, and most recently, Answers Unleashed, the science of unleashing your brain's power, Olympia Lapointe. Welcome, welcome. Hey. So good to have you on the show. Oh, wow. So your story is crazy. Thank you. There's growing up hard and there's growing up hard. <laughs> you definitely overcame a lot. Walk us through that a little bit, because I think that what you accomplished, even if you'd come from uh, an upper middle class family, would have been extraordinary. But to have really had to struggle the way that you did, and it'll be so hard to capture here, the way that it is in the book, how just so many things are going on at once, but you managed to fight through that. But give us a little taste. Well, Tom, thank you so much. I'm just so, so happy to be here on your show and to share my story and to uh, inspire your audience. But what I really want to get across to people is that no matter what type of circumstances that you have been raised in or have experienced, you always have the ability to find a way out and create success for yourself. And I had to do that in my own life. And it was not easy. And in when I look back, my childhood was very rough. Um, I grew up in South Central Los Angeles. Uh, I was a person who uh, was in a single family home. It was my mother took care of four of us by herself and she struggled and we were on welfare. We didn't have money and sometimes we didn't have food to eat. And uh, we didn't know any different. But what the difference was, was when we would go past at the time, it was USC was close by us. Mm -hmm. And I'd see all the college students go towards the campus, and I thought to myself, where are they going? What, what are they doing? Why do they look different than the rest of the people that are in the, the group? And, and that always kept in the back of my head. And our mother said, whatever you do, in order to change your circumstance, you're gonna have to get an education. And so I, I kept that in the back of my head. I, no matter what, I had to educate myself. I had to get a degree. I, the people that I saw going to the school down the street, that's something I could do. And I had that vision. And it, it through a series of circumstances, uh, it was very rough. Um, and when I was 10 years old, I was sitting next to this boy in this classroom, and he and I got into an argument. And because we were two kids in the same position, same location and time, but our choices were different. And at that moment in time, we got into an argument. And I always had a smart mouth. I always had a way to be <laughs> able to uh, push buttons because I, 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 I didn't know the power of my words back then. And now I do, and, and now I actually embrace that. But at the time, I was a 10-year-old child. I was pushing buttons, and he got upset. And he stood up, and he hit me right underneath my eye. Mm. 
And I remember uh, all of my entire vision going dark and hearing screams. And that's when I felt the wet on my face. And then I heard, oh my God, there's blood, there's blood. And I'm like, is that what the wet I feel? And I couldn't see anything. And part of it was kind of a blurred out because anytime we go through traumatic experiences, sometimes the brain actually just hides it. Mm. And then I remember being brought to the hospital and where uh, the surgeon put uh, five layers of stitches in my face. And he said, had this been any higher, you would have lost your eye. And I remember just being kind of like shocked that I was this 10 year old child there, not necessarily knowing uh, what to do. But the, the surgeon said something that I'll always remember. He said, I'm gonna sew your face so well that all you'll see is a line. And then when you get on TV in the future, all you'll see is a line. If you ever want to get rid of it, you can have plastic surgery. But I'm going to sew this up so well that when you get on TV in the future to tell your story, that's all they'll see. And here I was, this 10-year-old child, listening to this. And suddenly, for me being laying there, getting stitches in my face, I wasn't thinking about the stitches. I was thinking, oh, I'm going to be on TV. I'm actually going to be able to do something. And that was like the exciting part. And later on after that, my mother pulled me out of that school to keep me safe. And then she put me into this school completely on the other side of town. And it was a gifted school, gifted magnet. And I was with people who were brilliant. They were geniuses. And I was nowhere near <laughs> how brilliant these people were. And I, I remember finding myself having to listen to what they were saying because how they said it was in different words than I used. I spoke with a broken English and that was the type of environment that we're in because we weren't taught the proper way of, of speaking English and I even had an accent before. And I remember being around these individuals and uh, I, I remember just listening to their voice and thinking, they're using words differently than how I use it. And I, I studied how people spoke. I was gonna say, so I have a theory about the inner cities. So the inner cities, um, so I went to USC and did some big brother-like work in the inner cities and really got a sense of- Thank you for what, doing that. Oh, for sure. Oh, that, gosh, that's a whole you. another story for another day, which doesn't touch what you've done. But um, being there and seeing that, you yeah. begin to get a real sense of the adversity that has yeah. to be overcome. And I believe that most of the people that the inner city touches, it destroys. But every now and then, it creates somebody extraordinary. What was it that made you listen? What was it that made you say, I, I'm going to adopt that, I'm gonna learn that, I'm gonna get out of this? Like, why doesn't that happen to everybody? You, you pose such a great question. When you are expected to succeed, by your mentors or parents or, or teachers, when there is an expectation on your life to do well, at an early age, you adopt it, you address it, you adhere to it, you create it. Mm. But if you are never given that opportunity to know what you are capable of doing, if you are never given that, uh, that word, that encouragement that says, do you know what, you can be good at mathematics even though you failed algebra and geometry and calculus and chemistry, which I did, crazy. you can actually do well in mathematics. Had, if, if there's not someone showing you your worth when you can't see it, you'll forever be looking in the mirror thinking that you're not worth what you are. And for me, every single time I went to, I went to that school across town, it was like around two, two hours away from where I was. Every time I would come back, it was like a, a, a wake up call. I would go to this school that was like in a predominantly well off area and everyone had books and, and paper and really nice shoes. And I remember looking at this thinking, oh, I don't have any of that. And every time I would come back into my neighborhood, I would see the graffiti and I'd see the, the trash. And I thought to myself, what makes a difference? Why are there people here in this situation versus here in this situation? And every single day I would come back and it came down to this. It was the thinking, how we think, how we look at situations, whether or not we see ourselves doing well and being successful or versus if we see ourselves as a, a not successful person in an environment, our thinking defines our life. And when we can take hold of our thought, 
and see it for what it is and change it and transform it and change it to convert it into an energy that unleashes a brain power that allows us to change a situation, that, my friend, is how we change our lives and that's how we change everyone else's lives. Do you know who Luther Campbell is? Tell me who Luther So is. he was the lead singer of Two Live Crew, yeah. so he had a very similar situation. So he grew up in um, South Florida, I think just outside of Miami, mm -hmm. and he used to get bused from the inner cities into a wealthy neighborhood to play football because mm. he was good. And he had a very similar experience. It was interesting hearing you describe that, which you, you didn't go into as much detail in the book about the back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But hearing that, like that would be such a visceral reminder of the change. So when I was big brothering, I used to do that. I would take him to Beverly Hills mm -hmm. to watch movies because I wanted him to see something beautiful. That was like this driving thing in me. I was like, this it can't be all that he sees is this yeah. Literal concrete jungle, right? Like the yeah, only thing seriously. he saw going from home to school was concrete. I mean, there's like literally three trees. I mean, there's nothing. And so just trying to get that that visual. Did that Was that something that you thought about in real time where you're like, I need to get out of this? Like this is going from something beautiful that I want to something that is painful that I want to get out of? Uh, every place has its pros and cons. Really great places will still have a con to it. Uh, really horrific places will have a benefit to it. And it's all how we see a situation. Mm. Uh, every time I was bussed into that school, I felt, oh wow, I get a chance to learn. But at the same time, I realized how superficial it was. Everyone uh, looked at each other based on what they owned versus what, how, what their character was. And so I saw the benefit and the detriment of that situation. And then when I came back home and was bused into the area, immediately when I came off the bus, it was like, all right, how do I make sure I'm not shot down? Uh, this is literally what right. went through my head. Your mom used to make you guys sleep, sleep. with your feet to the, yeah. the street side. Yeah, and it, it sounds, it, when I say this now, I realize the well, character. Well, tell people why, though. right? Uh, when I was, uh, when I get off that bus and then I uh, come home, there was a lot of gang violence. Mm. And I was very thankful to be able to get home. And once we got inside the door and inside the house, we're like, okay, we're somewhat safe. Uh, but there was a crack house next to our house. And my mother had decided to go back to school uh, shortly before they had moved in. And she went to night school, and when she found out that there was a crack house, she had to drop going to night school to stay at home to keep us safe. And uh, there, were, she put up this metal on the side of the wall. And she had to sleep in the bed in a certain direction. And she said, I'm having you sleep this way, and I'm gonna put this metal up. So if a bullet comes to the wall, hopefully it hit the metal first. Mm. And if it pierces through the metal, at least it will hit your feet and not your head. And this is where we grew up. And I remember making a note to myself, I will do anything and everything to make sure I am not gonna place myself in a situation like this, and I'm gonna get an education so I can encourage other people to be able to succeed in life. And that was my decision because I, no one should have to go through that. But the beautiful part about going through that is no matter what type of situation I faced in the future, if I could get through that, I could get through anything. Yeah, and I mean, knowing your story, it's like, okay, that was already insane to be able to get over that. But going from that, then you go to, in, in your TED Talk, the way that you told the story is really interesting. You're like building it up, and in 11th grade, I finally meet this tutor, and he teaches me you know, how to do calculus, and I'm finally getting it, I realize I can do it, and I take the AP test, and I want to tell you that I passed, <laughs> but I don't. I know, I like failed it. I like so failed how do you go from that to like fifth in your class? and graduate with a degree in mathematics when people are telling you to quit, by the way. Oh yeah, oh yeah, So like, oh, yeah. what what's going on in your mind? What are the mindset pieces that you're putting together to not let people stop you, to not let naysayers slow you down? Like, what are you doing mentally? Oh, woo, it was a mental challenge, I must tell you. And and uh, what happened was I was failing algebra, I failed algebra, I failed geometry, I failed uh, what, what, calculus and chemistry. And uh, there was this calculus teacher that said, all right, I'm gonna offer uh, calculus tutoring for anyone who's willing to come to the campus during the winter break. And I thought everyone was gonna go. And uh, I didn't even have money to go at the time. And I thought, this is an opportunity. Someone's gonna tutor me, this is great. And, and I remember specifically it cost $1.35 to get on the bus, to, to get the bus there and back. And I didn't even have that. And 
I will never forget. It was the gas attendant. It was like it was like a local gas station. It was a gas attendant. He knew I was so dedicated to go to school. He loaned me, not loaned, he basically gave it because I never had a chance to pay him back, but he gave me a dollar thirty-five each way so I could catch a bus two hours to get to the campus. That's pretty cool and sit there and I thought everyone was going to show up there was only myself wow. and and I thought to myself this is such a blessing and I sat there and I I picked his brain I'm like how how do I look what does an integral mean uh, what does the the tangent mean uh what does the instantaneous rate mean and these are all words for derivative and, and calculus and I got a chance to sit down with them and that was the first time ever that I realized I was smart. Mm. And when I sat with him, uh, it was amazing because I realized what was stopping me was my own fear. It wasn't, it wasn't anything with my educational aspect. It was me thinking I couldn't do well in mathematics. And when I learned to remove that fear and think, I'm going to do this no matter what's going to happen. I may fail it. I may not fail it. I'm gonna do well at this, and I'm gonna just, just see where it goes. I'm gonna put my all into it. I'm gonna find out. And I put my all into it, and I failed. <laughs> <laughs> I, put my all into it. I, I, I put my all into it, and I failed. But it, it, something inside of me shifted. I realized, hey, failing wasn't that bad. If I can, if I can like spend a little bit more time at it, I can actually do really well at this. And that was the shift in thinking. I'm like, all right, I'm just gonna spend some more time in it and I'm gonna actually get this. And I went to uh, Cal State Northridge and I'm very thankful. That was the best school I could have gone to uh, for me personally. And I went to Cal State Northridge and my first job that I had was a math tutoring job. And I scored, uh, because I had taken calculus and I'd taken those classes over, I scored relatively high on the placement test. Mm. And so the job, the o this is how ironic life is, the only job that I got first when I was in college was a math tutoring job. That's ironic. I know, isn't it? And I remember telling the boss that hired me, the late Jane Mrs. Pinkerton, God bless her, I told her, I don't know half this stuff. <laughs> 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 and, and so she says, that's all right, just sit down with him and just read the book with him. And I looked and I'm like, are you sure? And she said, yeah, just, just sit down and read the book with him. I'm like, okay, I mean, if I get paid to do this, sure. And so I, I, I sat down with the, with the uh, students and it was, they were, it was stressful too because I didn't know what half the terminology or anything was in the books. And I would sit down with him, I'm like, okay, I'm here to tutor you. You're like, well, how do you do this? And I, I just tell them the truth. I have no idea. I'm going to read the book with you. And they thought I was joking. <laughs> and so we literally sat and read the book together. And I found myself reading the algebra books, reading the geometry books, reading the calculus books, reading the statistics books, literally reading and studying. And I thank Jane Pinkerton because had she not hired me into that role, I would not have graduated top five wow. out of a 6,500 graduating class. It was because I sat down and worked with the students. I had, when I overcome my own fear, it was when I was working with someone else and recognizing that the person next to me was the exact mirror of myself. And as if, as I could help that person right next to me, I was helping myself at the same time. And it became this teamwork. Every single person on the campus needed mathematics. And so I got a chance to know everybody on the campus and became one of the most popular people because everyone needed mathematics. And that confidence that was built from taking something that I failed at before and shifting my thinking about it and embracing it to actually create a new reality for myself, that's what empowered me. And that's what allowed me to graduate top of my class, which later on opened up the door to launch rockets. It's incredible, and we'll get to the launching rockets in a second, but let's talk about neuroplasticity. So uh, one of the things that you talk about in your TED Talk is literally reprogramming your brain yeah. to uh, overcome the fear, to deconstruct it. And I think you said fear is a choice, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So walk us through that. Why is fear a choice? How do we use neuroplasticity? What is that look like? What's the real process mm. to make that happen? Uh, that's such a great question. And I, I love being on your show because you ask great questions. Thank you. You ask questions that hit home. Uh, through a series of events, uh, I learned the power that we have in our, our brain. 
when I overcame so many challenges when I was launching rockets of being a, a woman and, and being a, one, a person of color in a predominantly area that was different than myself, right. I, had to, I had to think differently. I had to think, all right, I'm going to stand out. Everything that I do is going to have to be twice as good. That's just the nature of it. And I had to change the way in which I was thinking in order to do that. How am I going to be such a contributing force to this environment that whenever I leave, I've made a difference? And when I realized that, and then when I coupled that with the aspect of mathematics, where the same type of math that we use to launch to Mars is the same type of math that we use to literally reshape our own brain, I realized the power of our thoughts. What Neuro and when you say that, so I'll push a little bit on that. So when you say that, one, I don't think most people know chaos theory. So chaos theory basically, you'll check me if I'm wrong, uh, chaos theory basically states that the beginning circumstances matter a lot. And so it also known as the butterfly effect, right? The butterfly flaps its wings in Shanghai and there's a storm in Australia. So now if I'm, and fractals, ever repeating patterns in nature, which are fractals, so that plays a huge part in chaos theory. Uh, are you saying that that's what's happening in the brain and that's a key part of yes. Um, neuroplasticity? Yes, Okay. yes. A chaos theory is the study of chaos. When you, two things happen at the same time, one will have a completely different effect than the other person. Or let's say, let's show you an example, there's two twins born. Mm. One twin ends up with cancer, the other one ends up living an entire long life. What was the difference if they had the same DNA? What changes them to have two different outcomes. Chaos theory is like, okay, you can be in space, you can go towards one destination, but any slight change in position will completely stall your vehicle or it will throw you to Mars. Depending on what your movement is, chaos is the type of mapping that gets you there. So how do you take that into account mathematically, which will make this analogy just really powerful? When we have thoughts, neuroplasticity, self-directed neuroplasticity is the ability to change our own structure of our brain in our head by being aware. How chaos theory affects our brain is that when we are aware of where we are, what we're doing, and more importantly, the decision that we have in front of us, the choice in our thought in a situation Whatever decision that we make in that full awareness, that decision in itself is a fractal moment in chaos that literally changes the brain at that very moment to restructure it inside of your head so you can unleash your power. So, okay, neurons that fire together, wire together, and I um, understand the process of myelination well enough to sort of know a little bit about the architecture of what's happening. Um, so if you're thinking a thought and you're just practicing, let's say, which is a great example of neuroplasticity, right? So I'm going to practice it over and over and over. Those neurons are going to fire together continuously. They're going to literally rewire like you're talking about in sort of that chaos moment. Uh, the myelination makes things travel more quickly. So now I'm actually getting better, meaning faster and more capable of thinking that thought. What can people do on a daily basis? Like when you were having one of these um, moments, which I'm glad you say you start with awareness, right? What am I trying to do? So if they know what they want to do, but they don't know how to get there and they don't know how to trigger the neuroplasticity, what advice do you have? When you look at how are my thoughts going to align with where I want to go and you decide that moment in time where you decide this is a thought that's going to get me to being a rocket scientist. This is a thought that's going to get me to be a doctor. This is a thought to get me to be a host of my own show. I'm whatever it takes. I'm going to have all the type of thoughts that's going to get me closer to where I want to go in the future. When we realize that we have a choice in how we think about things, where we have a choice, are we going to be scared about something or are we going to go for it no matter what's going to happen? That is when we unleash this power to here. What was the thought that you had that let you become a rocket scientist? The thought was back in 1986 when Challenger exploded. Wow. Uh, I saw on the TV and, and some of the younger crowd that's looking at this, if you have an opportunity, go to, I actually write about this on the Huffington Post. Uh, it's one of my uh, 
articles out there and, and Google Challenger Explosion. It was January 28th, 1986. And all of us were young kids and we were looking on the TV. I remember this. To, you remember that too? Oh, yes. And, and it was like horrible. Like schools all across the entire United States was looking at the first teacher going up right. into outer space. And she was going with uh, a group of astronauts and there was a series of events that happened that uh, created the O-ring to freeze and warp. And so when they lit the rockets, the solid rocket booster literally tilted and it, um, and it, it ruptured the external tank. And the external tank and for the space shuttle was like the gas tank. And it punctured the gas tank with this, this fire. And there was just fire. The entire explosion killed everyone, but it didn't kill the astronauts. They were actually in a, a pressurized chamber that was supposed to withstand that type of uh, explosion. And I remember their capsule went into the to the ocean and when the capsule actually went down into, uh, it hit the ocean, it cracked open like an egg and they died drowning. Whoa. Yeah, yeah, uh, people don't necessarily know that. And when I found that out and I was just so in shock, I, and Gandhi has a quote, it says, you must be the change that you wish to see in the world. Mm. And I remember seeing that and I'm thinking, shouldn't somebody have done something to, so that wouldn't have happened? And I didn't realize that at that very moment, when I looked and saw that, I thought, I'm going to be a person to help prevent that. And it wasn't until, I think I was like, how old when I, I think I was like nine when that happened, and eight or nine. And then I was sitting, the moment in time where I realized, oh my God, my dream of becoming a rocket scientist actually came true. It wasn't when I became a rocket scientist. I actually didn't remember that I made that decision when I was like eight or nine, like I was going to do this until I was actually sitting at my desk at work and I looked and I thought, whoa, I'm doing rocket science work. <laughs> and I looked, I was in the exact same department to prevent the type of failures that I saw when I was nine years old. I was gonna say, that became your job, right? You were the one that had to dissect whether something was gonna blow up or not. I signed engine tests. They couldn't test the spatial domain engine without my signature. I, and that was one of the most stressful jobs I've ever taken. But you have, to, you have to know everything. You have to know every bolt. You have to know every weld. You have to know every single pressurized system, how long uh, of hot fire each engine has been through, uh, the ISP, how uh, the ISP is like the horsepower of the, of the rocket. And you had to know all of this to authorize that. Your signature meant nobody's life was going to be in danger because you've done all that checking. Yeah. Yeah, you likened it to having to look into the future, right? Yeah. To be able to look at a schematic and know sort of what happens in the future. I found that pretty interesting. In fact, I think I have a, a quote here about it. Your role was devised in a way to pick the future that would ensure flight. And I really like that concept of you're picking a future, right? Mm -hmm. So you're, you're going through the schematic, you're looking at everything, the bolts, the, the way that the rings fit, everything. You, you kept saying nooks and crannies, like you have to know every, every inch of these things. And then in your mind, construct a vision of the multiple ways that it could play out. Yeah. Um, how does that apply to like normal life? Because oh. I think that's actually very akin to what we're all doing. Yeah, um, it applies 100%. Uh, the key thing is that you have to put into your head exactly what it is. You have to envision it before it happens. And then you have to envision what you don't want to happen. You have to do both of it. I was saying that in the book and I was so surprised. I took a note on that because normally when you talk visualization, you tell people don't think about the thing that you don't want, right? So the, um, the hands follow the eyes, I think is the phrase in racing. So it's like wherever you look, you're going to go. So if you're looking to the things you don't want, you're going to self-destruct. But you were saying that you guys really had to think about how exactly does this go right and how exactly does this yeah, go wrong? Yeah, you have to how know does that help both. When you see exactly what you don't want, if you can take the exact opposite of that, that's how you find out what you do want. For example, when we launched rockets, we knew, okay, we didn't want there to be an explosion out the jacket, which was like the side of the rocket. 
but we wanted the explosion to go down. So we thought, okay, what is the worst case scenario? And the worst case scenario is, okay, there will be a kind of tire flames blowing out where we don't want it to go. So we're like, how can we prevent that? How can we focus on where we do want it to go? Where's the ideal part for it to go? And the ideal part is for the, the, all the flames to go down the tubes and go through and create a plume. So what we had to do in that aspect is literally envision exactly what we didn't want and figure out the chain of events that could possibly get us there to what we don't want and then go backwards. The fascinating thing about that is it's not just theoretical. This is actually what you did. Yeah. So tell us the story of Zhao. Tell us how that helped. It seemed to, to really be an important moment. Uh, uh, Zhao, Zhao is his name. And uh, he was a man from China. And uh, he uh, was brilliant and is brilliant. Uh, I'm still fascinated by how his brain works. And uh, the beauty about working uh, in rocket science is that I had the ability to observe genius brains. And I realized that any of us can gain a genius brain no matter what age we're at. It doesn't matter. Forget it, what anyone's ever told you. You can gain a smart brain at any age, at any age. I wanna dive into that for a second because you said something really important because in, in the math class, they were telling you, you're not gonna succeed, you keep doing it. And oh, we don't really have time to go deep on this, but your mom had a very traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. And you said, you have to decide you're gonna heal no matter what the doctors are telling you. Yes. So yeah, that, that point of decision is a recurring theme with you, which I find yes. very, very interesting. Yes, decisions reshape the brain. Every decision that you make reshapes your brain. The more powerful that you are in making decision after decision after decision, the more powerful your brain becomes. Does that make you really careful about what decisions you make? Like, are you super aware when you're making decisions? I've learned to become aware. And I've learned to become aware to see, all right, this is where I want to go. How is this decision going to help me get there? Mm. It's always keeping that in the back of your head, like this is where I'm going to go. And I'd made the decision very early in life that no matter where I was, I was going to change it. I was going to change it so I would leave my mark to be able to help in a very powerful way so people after I leave would be able to make their own mark and, and build it in a way in which was going to be very uh, powerful for their life. And the reason why I love Zhao, and I'm so thankful for him, he took me underneath his wing. And I, I didn't know anything about rockets at the time. I knew math, didn't know anything about rockets. And he was overworked and he had tons of paper on his desk. And uh, he helped me understand gra my graduate school work. And I would finish my work early uh, in the one department that I was in at first. And I looked at him and I did something that no corporate person ever does. I said, oh, do you need help? I'll stay after and help you. <laughs> I was just so fascinated with what he was doing. And he became my mentor. I was just, I was just sitting next to him to watch how his brain worked. I mean, it's just, it, was, it was a similar thing to when I went to West into those schools and, mm. and how I had to listen and, and see how people were communicating. They were communicating differently. Here that was again. That, that, that situation was repeating in my life. And here I was next to this man and all these other people who were like brilliant at what they were doing. I had to observe. I, I, I wasn't raised like that. I, I had to find out how they communicated, how they saw things. And each time I could get inside of their brain, I understood more my brain more. So as I was working with Zhao and I could get inside his brain, I was looking at how he interacted with people, how he handled work. I'm like, how does that work for him? How can I tailor that for myself? And that's where Zhao and I became so most helpful. This is the funniest thing. He had spoke with a really uh, deep accent. I mean, it was like really, really deep and no one could understand him. <laughs> and I could understand him just fine. And we found ourselves a team and he would introduce me to other people. And when he couldn't do a project, he says, I'm going to recommend Olympia. She can do exactly what I can do and she can help you too. And we built this network and it was this connected network where we were all supporting each other. So even though they were the people that were out there that were very like, uh, oh, trying to, to right. push your buttons, I knew I was connected. I knew I had people who had my back and I had their back. And we all uh, took ownership and integrity in what we did and we always were honest with one another. That's amazing. And that notion of camaraderie and finding people that have your back and you have their back I think is really, really important. So what advice do you have to women who 
are contemplating going into STEM. If you're a woman interested in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, do it, study it, learn it. We need you. <laughs> do it. I, I would love to have you. If you're a person in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, in other words, STEM, go into it, do it. There is such a overwhelming need for you because you have the ability to see the big picture. You have the ability not only to do the mathematics, but you have the ability to see the big picture and use your communication skills in order for people to see how important concepts are. So that is the gift that you bring. If you have the opportunity to go into that STEM, do it. And find me on Facebook. Let me know that you go into STEM. I would love to hear about it. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Tell everybody, before I ask my last question, tell everybody where they can find you online. Uh, you can find me on AnswersUnleashed.com. And I have uh, my own show. And it has all these different tips for people to go into science and how to reshape your brain. You can always find me on Facebook.com slash Olympia LaPointe. And there's always the main website, Olympia LaPointe. So you can find me in all the different ways. Nice. All right. Final question. What is the impact that you want to have on the world? Mm. The impact that I want to have on the world is to use media for people to realize that their thoughts have power. I like that. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Olympia, thank you so much for being on the show. What an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, thank you. this is such an amazing story of somebody overcoming the odds. I cannot tell you how much I was inspired by this. If you enjoy hearing tales of somebody that really has to put in the work, overcome, it reads like a Hollywood story, I'm not kidding. It's absolutely crazy. From starting in poverty, from the struggles that her mom went to. But at every turn, it's a story of somebody who can see the permutations of her future, make the decision, and always be moving forward, going towards them, never making excuses, understanding that fear is a choice, understanding that at the end of the day, it comes down to you, it comes down to the work that you're willing to put in, and maybe most beautifully, the team that you're able to gather around you by helping them also make their dreams come true. It's an incredible story. Guys, this is a weekly show, so if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for watching. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And for exclusive content, be sure to sign up for our newsletter. All of that stuff helps us get even more amazing guests on the show and helps us continue to build this community, which at the end of the day is all we care about. So thank you guys so much for being a part of the Impact Theory community.